hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to tell you about the changes that we're making in the UK to maximise the economic recovery of our oil and gas resources for the benefit of industry, but also for the UK as a whole. Uh, before I go into the detail of the changes that we're making, um, I'm going to say a little bit about how we got to where we are. Um, the good thing is that this correlates with some of the things that we heard earlier from the analysts, um, but I will go through it fairly speedily. So to begin with, a brief introduction to the UK oil and gas industry. Um, the UK's oil and gas industry is of significant national importance. It's one of our biggest industrial success stories, a huge contributor to our economic employment and energy security. The first licence was issued in 1964, and since then, the UK CS has produced over 42 billion barrels of oil equivalent, powering the country and contributing over £300 billion in taxes to the Exchequer. The industry currently supports around 350,000 jobs directly and indirectly, plus another 100,000 in exporting goods and services. And the UK CS production contributes to our um, energy security, satisfying around 60% of the UK's oil demand and about 50% of our gas demand. It's worth noting that Brit Oil, the UK's national oil company, was privatised in the 1980s, um, so the UK government doesn't have an equity state in the UK CS. However, since the first licence was issued 50 years ago, much has changed in the UK CS. Um, as you can see, and as, as we heard earlier, um, the chart shows that UK production um, by the start-up year of fields. So you can see that some of our largest fields began producing early in the basin's life, uh, including Forties in 1975, Brent in 1976, and Ninian in 1978. In the early years of production, the UK CS was primarily comprised of large fields operated by the super majors and big enough to support their own infrastructure to transport their product back to the beach. However, the UK CS is a very different operating environment now than it was 20 years ago, with far more smaller fields coming into production in recent years. As a result, we've now got over 300 fields, many of which are smaller and more interconnected than ever before. For example, recent data shows that the average UKCS discovery size over the past 10 years has been 25 million barrels of oil equivalent. And the UK now has a more diverse range of operators, from super majors to smaller independents, who must work in collaboration and share infrastructure to make these smaller fields economic. Conversely, as the, number, as the complexity of the basin has increased, the number of government staff in the UK dedicated to stewarding the UK continental shelf has fallen from around 90 in the mid-1990s to around 50 now, and that's at a time when the need for government action to facilitate industry collaboration, collaboration is increasing. So on one hand, this is an exciting time for the UK continental shelf. In the previous licensing round in 2012, there were more applications for exploration licences in the UKCS than at any time since licensing began in 1964, and over 200 licence awards were made. We've subsequently launched um, another offshore round um, in April this year and received over 170 applications for more than 350 blocks confirming continued strong interest in North Sea exploration and development. And last year saw a record investment of over £14 billion. While this increase in investment is positive, it's likely that much of it was driven by recent field allowances introduced by government, and it does mask some of the serious underlying problems with UK CS performance over the recent years. So while industry was announcing a number of new investments over the past year or so, the government took a long, hard look at a number of key performance factors, production, exploration, production efficiency, and it's fair to say that we didn't like what we saw. That's why government took the initiative to set up the Wood Review to examine what we could do to turn this around. And we took this step 
um, and we were very glad to see that the industry recognised the need to get behind the review. So as I've said, when we looked at recent performance statistics, it was clear that many of the most relevant performance indicators had been going in the wrong direction in recent years. For example, production fell by 37% from 2010 to 2013. In addition to falling production, the level of exploration activity is at a historically low level, down from 160 exploration wells being drilled in 1990 to around 20 in 2013. There's a real and urgent need to address this in the UKCS, as without making successful new discoveries, we won't extract the maximum amount of economically recoverable resources from the UKCS and we risk the premature decommissioning of infrastructure if new fields aren't identified early enough. And in another key area, production efficiency, we've also seen an unacceptable trend. Production efficiency has fallen over the last decade from around 80% to around 60%. While ageing assets are a factor, Operator underinvestment in assets and insufficient uptake of enhanced oil recovery techniques have undoubtedly have an, had a negative effect on production efficiency. Where operators are unwilling to invest in assets to ensure production efficiency is maximised, it's in the UK's interest that these assets can be passed to other operators who are willing to invest. We've already seen examples of, often, um, of new, often smaller operators making strong performance gains when taking over older assets, such as the performance of Apache when they took over 40s. There's also urgent need for action on decommissioning. In many areas, the UKCS is a maturing basin, and many operating assets are over 30 years old, at or in many cases beyond the end of their intended design life. As a result, DEC and industry must face the challenge of maintaining ageing infrastructure, encouraging new infrastructure investment, and ensuring full infrastructure utilisation through better industry collaboration. And when the time to decommission comes, we must also face the challenge of decommissioning, which on current estimates will cost more than £45 billion in today's money over the next 50 years. Over half of the decommissioning costs will be met by the government through tax relief. It's therefore vital that both government and industry work together to urgently address the escalating costs of decommissioning. For example, a 25% reduction in decommissioning costs would, would save the Exchequer over £5 billion. So it's a prize worth having. And the maturing nature of the UK continental shelf has led to the increasing risk that key offshore assets, production platforms and pipelines will be decommissioned prematurely, which stranding existing and undiscovered reserves in regions such as the Southern North Sea. So we know that the UKCS faces challenges that we must address to ensure the future of the industry is as successful as its past. And it was against that backdrop that Edward Davey, the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, commissioned Sir Ian Wood to carry out a review of what could be done differently to maximise economic recovery from the UKCS. Sir Ian set about his task with typical vigour um, and supported by a small team from DEC and industry, sought input from key stakeholders with an interest in the UKCS. Sir Ian also examined the way in which other countries manage their oil and gas resources. And as a result of this review, Sir Ian identified the following key issues to be addressed. Firstly, a lack of focus on maximising economic recovery for the good of the UK. Operators have pursued individual commercial objectives in isolation, with limited commitment or obligation to maximise economic recovery um, across fields or within regions of the UKCS. Although tax was out with the scope of the review, um, it found that fiscal instability had been a significant factor in basin underperformance. Current government stewardship um, was towards the, the light touch end of intervention, um, and the review found that it won't be adequate to manage the future challenges of the UKCS and will require greater resource to perform effectively. 
the rapid fall in production efficiency is an indication of poor industry stewardship, according to the review, um, and stewardship of assets must be improved. A lack of collaboration and overzealous legal and commercial behaviour between operators had increased costs, caused delay and led to poorer recovery. And finally, the high quality strategic thinking done by Pilot, which is the government and industry joint forum, um, hasn't actually been implemented effectively. So in February of this year, Sir Ian published his final report. His key recommendations were that a new regulator, the Treasury and industry, must adopt a cohesive tripartite approach um, to commit to a new shared strategy for maximising economic recovery for the UK, to maximise the huge economic and energy security opportunity that still lies off of the UK shores. DEC should create a new arm's length body charged with effective stewardship and regulation of the UKCS hydrocarbon recovery and maximising collaboration across the industry. To underpin delivery of the strategy, government should fully ut utilise its, its existing powers and take a series of additional powers, for example, the right for the new regulator to attend consortium meetings, um, establishing a clear system of informal and formal warnings, which could ultimately lead to the loss of operatorship and then licence. And finally, the new body should work with industry to develop and implement six sector strategies, um, for exploration, infrastructure, asset stewardship, technology, regional development and decommissioning. So Ian also recommended that industry should make a series of commitments against which they'll be held accountable. In his report, Sir Ian outlined that these commitments should be in areas such as committing to delivering the UK, um, maximising economic re recovery UK principles, um, developing cluster plans and making economic use of infrastructure, developing new infrastructure models, more efficient sharing of infrastructure, improving asset stewardship, improving collaboration, reducing the legal and commercial burdens of working in the UKCS, uh, and implementing the oil and gas industrial strategy, which focuses on the supply chain and skills issues. We've accepted Sir Ian's recommendations and have been working extremely hard to identify how we can best implement these recommendations to have real um, maximum impact. This is a once in a generation opportunity to make real and long lasting changes for the benefit of all parties and the UK government is determined to seize that opportunity. I'm pleased to report strong progress in implementing the recommendations of the Wood Review, including establishing a new arm's length body, which will be called the Oil and Gas Authority and will be headquartered in Aberdeen. In July, we published our formal government response to Sir Ian's recommendations, which set out in a bit more detail how we intend to implement the required changes. We've set up a, an interim advisory panel um, chaired by Sir Ian to provide advice um, and support on implementation. And we're making good progress on the legislation required to equip the new body with the powers it needs. Um, and the UK, the Maximising Economic Recovery UK principles have been introduced to Parliament in a bill, along with a power to introduce a levy on industry to fund the costs of the new regulator. Over the long term, the Oil and Gas Authority will be fully funded by industry. Um, however, as a show of commitment to setting it up quickly and as effectively as possible, the UK government will contribute short-term funding of £15 million to the body over the next five years. We've prioritised the recruitment of a new chief executive to lead the Oil and Gas Authority and have launched the search for an experienced, respected and inspiring leader to deliver the change required. We hope to be in a position to appoint a CEO fairly shortly, um, certainly this autumn, so that they can begin to shape the new body that they will lead. It will take some time to implement these changes and to establish the new body in legislation in its final form as a government company, um, which will take place in 2016. Um, however, we believe that it's important to get this body up and running as quickly as possible. So we're planning to start um, shadow running um, in the form of an executive agency from April next year. 
We're currently working through the details of how we can best achieve that. So if the new tripartite approach is to work, all parties have got to play their part to commit to the new MER UK strategy. This will require a new spirit of increased collaboration, both within industry and with government. And things will on occasion feel different and perhaps uncomfortable at an operational level um, for industry when dealing with a stronger, more proactive and better resourced regulator. Therefore, we take great confidence from the support from industry leaders for the Wood Review and for the recommendations contained within it. We're committed to ensuring that the new regulator has the right technical capabilities and capacity to perform this role effectively, as well as the right powers to ensure that they can deliver the MER UK principles. It's hoped that these powers will seldom need to be used, however, they're a necessary tool for the regulator to have. So what will the new post-wood UK continental shelf look like um, for both government and operators? Well, firstly, the Oil and Gas Authority. Um, the OGA will be more proactive and involved, using its powers and influence for the good of the UK. Um, importantly, it will also have sufficient resource and the wide range of skills it will require to be able to do so. Dealing with the OGA will feel different for industry. Um, as a regulator, it will be much more closely involved, um, ensuring operators are meeting their asset stewardship obligations and facilitating collaboration in areas such as regional cluster developments. While in some instances this may feel a little uncomfortable for industry, the outcome will mean economic recovery is maximised, resulting in greater benefits for everybody. The OGA will also seek to attract new entrants to the UKCS, encouraging investment to put us in the best place to extract the substantial resources that still remain. Moving on to the Treasury. Um, as a key part of the tripartite approach, Treasury's role will be to provide the right fiscal environment to maximise recovery from the UKCS. To help achieve this, Treasury have launched a review of the North Sea fiscal regime and have published a call for evidence, which closed on the 3rd of October. Um, and they'll be making further announcements in the autumn statement later this, later this year. In the longer term, the OGA will provide advice to the Treasury to help inform future fiscal decisions and to ensure that fiscal decisions are made um, in uh, full knowledge of their impact on this sector. And DEC? DEC will be the sponsor department for the OGA, setting the high-level energy policy and making sure that good lines of communication are kept open. And industry. As Syrian's report states, the tripartite approach will not succeed if industry doesn't fully play its part. To maximise economic recovery, industry must commit to the delivery of the MER UK strategy and principles, as must everybody else in the tripartite, um, must routinely work in collaboration with government and with other operators, particularly in areas such as regional cluster developments, infrastructure access uh, and technology, to ensure that we recover more from mature fields um, and in decommissioning. They must improve the way they maintain and operate their assets, ensuring sufficient investment is made uh, to increase production and production efficiency. Uh, and they must reduce the legal and commercial burden that's taken hold of agreements and disputes in the UKCS, making better use of standard agreements and resolving disputes quicker. So I hope this has given you a brief understanding of the changes we're hoping to make and the reasons behind them. I'd like to leave you with three key messages. Firstly, the UK government is fully committed to the success of, oil, of our oil and gas industry in the decades to come. Secondly, there are significant resources that remain to be extracted. And finally, the changes we're making, we believe, will give us the best chance of recovering them, which will benefit the UK and industry. And with time to spare, thank you. Thank you very much. Just stay here with me for a little sure. while. Ms Murphy, thank you so much. Um, I think it's fairly clear to everybody now the seriousness with which the government of the UK is addressing these issues of the North Sea. Mm -hmm. um, I love the way you put it, it might be perhaps uncomfortably. I think everybody in the room realizes that it's going to be one hell of a set of un 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 uncomfortable issues ahead of you. Mm -hmm. 
dealing with industry that will most likely be recalcitrant and not very happy about these changes. I'm sure you would agree to that. Yes, I think um, one of the things which has struck me since starting this work um, is the very high level of industry support that we have behind the Wood Review and the recommendations. So, um, at, as, um, as, the, as we're working at the moment, um, we have strong support from industry and strong involvement from industry in our implementation programme. Um, I'm sure as we get down into the detail, there will be some quite thorny issues, um, but that's why it's so important that we set the OGA up as a body which properly understands industry and can speak industry's language so that it can enter a proper dialogue um, and work through those thorny issues. I'll invite you up here in a moment again, but just one more question now. What does it actually mean when you say this is a new regulatory body at arm's length? We're, um, we spent quite a lot of time working out what the right structure for this body should be. Um, we were very clear that the body needs um, a sufficient level of operational freedom. To, uh, it needs to be properly arm's length from government and from industry to be able to do its job. Um, we're setting it up as what we call a government company, which um, is, will effectively be just a normal company um, limited by shares um, with our Secretary of State as the sole shareholder. Th this, this means that um, the people who work for the regulator will no longer be civil servants. Um, it takes the body a, a big step further away from um, the government. Um, and crucially, it allows the body the freedom to set wages at the level that it needs to. Um, one, of, one of the recruitment challenges we've had is the inability for us to, um, as a government, to compete with the wages that the industry can pay. So within reason, the new body will have much greater freedoms to be able to do that and the powers to actually punish companies that do not comply with the recommendations of this body. One of the, one of the issues that we've, um, was uncovered in the Wood Review, and we've found it since we've been doing our work, is that um, the, the powers that the, re the current regulator in DEC has are sort of, if you'll pardon the pun, quite nuclear. Um, they, um, it, it's kind of, they, there's no graduated set of sanctions. It's either remove license or nothing. Um, so what we're going to put in place is a graduated set of, of sanctions, starting with private warnings, um, then public warnings, um, potentially fines. We're consulting industry on that point over the autumn um, and ultimately leading up to, to loss of license. So the, the regulator, although they will work primarily through collaboration and facilitation, they will have some, some teeth which, which, which they can use if they need to. Sounds like it. Thank you very much. Excellent.